Harvey is currently a senior fellow at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. But I've known Harvey since maybe the mid-70s. Uh, Harvey, after, his, after getting a PhD at Brown, Harvey was on the faculty here at Case Western Reserve University in the Department of Geology in the 70s, and left here to go to Princeton, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And then after Princeton left for Washington, D.C., where he's been since. And so uh, what I remember most about Harvey, of course, is his avid, he's an avid biker. Uh, he Still restores is. vintage bikes, if I remember correctly, too, and was also a very uh, uh, enthusiastic camper and outdoors person. So uh, the fact that uh, Harvey's involved in uh, energy and energy efficiency and the environment is absolutely no surprise to me. So without any further ado, Harvey. It's, it's a hoot to be back here, to be back at Case, and I do want to introduce my wife Susan, who was one of Ken's classmates and spent her career at Bell Labs, where I did a few years of hard service as well. And I should note also that our son Gregory, who got married this past weekend, is a graduate of this department. Do y'all hear me back there? They told me it was turned on. Okay, I've had a whole series of extinguished careers, and we're not going to talk about those, but there are a couple of points I've got to make clear at the start. And one of them is, not everybody stays on an academic track. Some people escape, or are escaped unto themselves or something. And once you leave, the question is much more what works than who was the author. And if plagiarism is stealing from one person, research is stealing from 20. And a lot of the slides that I will be using come from colleagues and associates, not only in my own organization, but in others. And that's OK in that other environment. We give credit at all times. Our work is always attributable. But we tend to be very pragmatic. This is sort of the, since they're video, videotaping this, this is what ACEEE is about. We're a non-government organization that advocates for energy efficiency for the betterment of the environment and the improvement of the economy. What differentiates us from a lot of the other advocacy groups is that we're founded on analysis. If we can't make the numbers work, whatever it is, we sit on our hands. There are an awful lot of special causes that sound like energy efficiency or renewables or something like that, on which we haven't said a word, because we can't make the numbers work. As a result, we have gained over the last quarter century, and I've only been there for seven and a half years now, the respect on both sides of the hill and in most of the agencies as being an organization whose numbers are credible. So they and the media frequently come to us. We wind up doing an awful lot of media work, in part because we're wholesalers, we're analysts. We can generate numbers, we can talk about policies, but we don't know how to reach consumers well. Yeah, we publish a little consumer book, go to our website, it's good stuff, it's aceee.org. Now, Context. Energy is big stuff, and this is not a way that you normally look at it, but this is from my colleague Skip Leitner. And the point here would be that per capita, or I think this is actually per business, there's a lot more money spent on energy than on state taxes. This happens to be for a Midwest talk he did. But the important point here is that those of us who work in buildings are used to thinking of energy as being that sort of two or three percent that's a part of operations. It's down an order of magnitude from your total cost of owning or renting that building. And the cost of the building is down an order of magnitude from the payroll you're putting into it. So how much management can you put into something that's one percent of your business? Well, if you can cut it 30 percent, you got some serious money that flows straight to the bottom line, right? They don't T ding you on your taxes for what you don't don't spend. Yeah. 
So we have some starting assumptions. And greening the economy starts with eliminating waste, more efficiency, and something about leadership. So energy efficiency is a cost-effective investment in the energy we don't use. Cost-effective investment in what we don't use. That is, what we don't waste. Now, we have to get a couple of concepts straight. This slide is taken from a Department of Energy standards proceeding, and we'll come back to that. But it's the very typical formalism that's expected for technologies. If you increase efficiency, and in this case it's the energy efficiency ratio, which is expressed in BTUs out of cooling per unit of electricity in, right? This will be on the test. <laughs> and it's always assumed that more efficiency means that it costs more, probably more copper in the heat exchanger, right? And it turns out that this assumption underlies everything that we do in the area of standards, to which we'll come back. It's a classic analysis, and it's wrong. It is dead wrong. 20 years ago, I started looking at data on refrigerator cost versus efficiency, and just did a simple regression of the efficiency, the cost, and a bunch of other variables, like whether the shelves were glass or wire, and other consumer value features. Turned out we couldn't pull efficiency out as being correlated with cost at all. That it was just one of the bundle of features you put into a refrigerator to attract a group of customers. It's part of the basket. So this is the first reason it's not right. They started with a snapshot at some point in time thinking this is the way products would look because it takes more copper to make a bigger heat exchanger. What it ignores is the incredible glory of manufacturing creativity. This is the most important slide I'll show you today. How many of y'all think you might wind up in industry? This is the cost of Model T Fords, and this is the centennial year from Model T Ford, expressed in constant 1958 dollars, and not expressed in terms of time, but in terms of the cumulative number of Model T Fords that had been produced. This is called a manufacturing learning curve. And it's an incredibly neat thing that everybody intuitively understands, except the Department of Energy and economists. Harvey, you might mention that's a log scale. This is a log scale, right? And it's got a mistake in it. But from 1909 to 1923, the cost dropped from about $4,000 to less than $1,000. What happened? Henry Ford learned how to build them better. He learned how to build them cheaper. Every time he sold another one, he thought about where he could wring some costs out. This is not unusual. How many people paid as much for their new computer as they paid for their last one? How many people bought a computer that didn't have features that were new this time? How many people are old enough to remember, to remember the Hewlett Packard four-function reverse Polish calculator 1973 for $395, 1973, which is about the cost of a PC today. That is an elaborate PC. Okay? The only people who don't understand this are economists who still think that the world works like this. So the cost of goods keeps coming down. And this is actually looking at the same doublings of production, which is correlated with time. It's not a linear function, but it's correlated for uh, magnetic ballast, electronic ballast, low E windows. These are high performance windows for buildings and integrated circuits. All of these, of course, would be carried back to the first unit hitting up there at the 1.0. Everything you buy has this kind of manufacturing cost. The guys who sold those first LCD equipped laptop computers, they were high cost. Now this is urban legend, but I'm told that high cost 
was because there were enormous stacks of contaminated glass out back of the factory. 90% had too many defective pixels and had to be tossed out instead of sold. When you doubled your quality control, that is when your quality control in manufacturing experience increased enough that you only threw out 80%, Nothing else changed about your manufacturing, but your cost per unit you could sell dropped in half. As you learn how to do stuff and play Deming's game of quality, your costs go down. So the question, this is data. Won't be on the test, but it will be on the video. They told me they're videotaping this. Okay? So you can see it. Learning rate is the annual decline, decline in costs, 58% for integrated circuits, 20% uh, for Model T Fords, and these things, of course, accumulate. This is again from my colleague, the economist. Now, turning from that, and this is a slide I took from the energy, from the Environmental Protection Agency's Energy Star people. Turning from that, let's think about some product and what its life cycle looks like. Some one of you guys has a brilliant idea for some new widget. That widget struggles at first to get any acceptance in the market. Assuming you find the right vulture capitalist and you can bring it to market and all that, it struggles. And there is a set of early adopters who will figure out some way to make money with it in their own business. And they'll put up with the hassles of not having any support and, no, and only idiots on the helpline and everything else. And then there are mainstream markets. Now, all the way over to the last guys who are still driving Buicks. Or did you trade? <laughs> so what we have to do if we want to bring more efficient technologies and methods into the market is to build a support framework that attacks this at all of these points. And we attack it in our organization with work on emerging technologies, work on market transformation, to get uptake increase. This is to identify the things which are the next generation. Work to get market uptake, to build a support environment around these products. The, the group of people who know how to use them, know how to install them and maintain them. And then we try to lock in the higher performance with building codes and with equipment standards. So I want to run quickly through some examples in each of these phases now. And there are too many slides, so I will skip some of them. Boom. You can't do it with that one. You have to do it with this one. Don't ever get old. This is the evolution of the U.S. economy for the last 30 years. The original slide was put together by Art Rosenfeld, who has pretty much recovered from his career in high energy physics. And some of you may have a similar background. He won a Fermi Prize recently from the Department of Energy. He's now in his 80s and is working as commissioner of the California Energy Commission. 1949 to 2005, the trajectory up to 1973 of actual energy use in the United States. Beyond that, we've done an extrapolation that basically is saying that we improved our energy intensity at the same rate after 1973 as before. And that rate was getting 0.49%, half a percent more GDP per BD, BTU each year. More economic benefit per dollar of GDP, per, per BTU invested, per British thermal unit. Okay? If we had continued on that trend, we would have used about 170 quads. A quad is a really great unit. It's 10 to the 15th BTUs. Okay? It's a big unit. In fact, we're only using about 100. So the difference is that we've grown our physical supply by about 25% in 35 years. That ain't fast. The rest of it has been at a drop rate, energy per unit of GDP, I'm sorry, I put it as GDP per energy. It's energy per GDP. It's dropped at 2.1% per year. 
And part of that is structural change in the economy, exporting our manufacturing business. Really stupid, but that's what we've done. And the rest of it has been becoming more efficient, doubling the miles per gallon of cars from 1980-something to 1990-something, okay, which was done with standards. So we want to disaggregate that a bit and see what it looks like. And this, again, is from Skip Leitner. It's for 2003, 4, and 5. And just looking at the blue numbers is an easy one. We added almost four quads of energy service demands. We met part of that with new energy supply, part of that with new efficiency gains, and part of that with shutting down another steel mill and the equivalent. Okay? So the important point here is that efficiency rivals new energy supply, and that includes everything from coal to, to wind. And has for a long time, but it's invisible. Unless you know how to look for it, you don't see it. Now, this is a report from McKinsey and Company, management consultants, who basically picked our brain and a bunch of other people and have put out a number of reports of this ilk. They have converted into a great business line. And this expresses the cost of new ways of meeting energy needs in functions of dollars per ton of carbon, because there's some attention being paid now to carbon in the rest of the world, if not in Washington, carbon and global warming. So here what we have is a variety of technologies, all of which are scaled this way by how much of it is and this way by how much it costs, from minus 90 dollars per, per metric ton all the way up to plus 90. Now, this is a very promiscuous set. It includes everything from commercial buildings, LED lighting, combined heat and power. I can't read that. <laughs> Distributed solar PV. Now, the first thing you want to notice and this is really important, is there are a bunch of things here that have negative cost. And this would be just as true if we put it in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour of energy, dollars per BTU. They have negative cost. Are there any economists in the room? Can you explain to me a negative cost? That's $20 bills lying on the pavement and nobody picking them up. We know that the, the economy is in equilibrium, that everybody is a perfect actor maximizing his utility. There's no reason that you haven't bought the perfect tire for your perfect vehicle, the one that optimizes your utility, is there? You have absolutely the right refrigerator in your apartment? You are an economic actor, aren't you? If you were, there would be nothing which would cost you less than what you're doing today. And yet McKinsey management gurus are telling you that there's almost enough stuff that would cost you less than what you're doing today than all of this stuff that would cost you a bit more. So that the reason we exist is not just as, as an organization, not just to do analyses, but to point out that these are opportunities for improving the economy by getting more services, more jobs, and environmental protection by simply thinking about all of the $20 bills that are lying around on the ground. And that economists haven't the faintest idea of how to model because we've seen how they understand that as efficiency increases, cost increases too, right? Now, this is another way of looking at it. This is a series of studies that we have done for different states in my organization. I've not been heavily involved in these except sort of as the truth teller, the one who says, no, you can't say that. And the point would be that the levelized cost of the saved energy, that's taking the cost of the investment in the better product, assuming it costs more, but taking 
the value of the electricity you don't use while discounting the electricity in the 20th year relative to the electricity in the first year. So it's a pure economic measure. And what I want you to see is that in a high cost state, Massachusetts, we can still get an awful lot of saved energy at less than four cents a kilowatt hour. Anybody still buying electricity for four cents a kilowatt hour? 20 cents in some states. And if you take all of our studies on emerging technologies and aggregate them, where these are individual measures, and look at that same levelized cost and compare it with some already obsolete figures for the supply side, coal gasification with carbon sequestration, we allow that to come in at eight and a half cents a kilowatt hour even if we don't know how to do it. Wind at a bit over seven, and David just told me that we have a billion dollars worth of contract at 10, nine and a half? 9.8. 9.8, where we gave it credit for seven, so we ought to push these things up. We're going to make the, the assertion that emerging technology, stuff that's not yet widespread in, u, in widespread use, is actually less expensive than stuff we know how to do, like pulverized coal. The question is how we can rejuvenate our industries. This is looking at it a slightly different way. Basically, the last slide is over here, and now what we're doing is adding to it some, car some carbon prices. Okay? It just makes the same case that nuclear, of course, has no carbon. Energy efficiency looks a lot cheaper than anything else you can buy. So why aren't you buying it? Well, you are buying some. This is just another version of the cost of new resources. So we're going to talk a little bit about emerging technologies, then market transformation, then codes and standards. OK. Emerging technologies, they're stuff that is not now important, but has the potential to generate large savings. And we do scans of this. We've published three of them, plus some additional work in the last decade and a half, to try to find things that ought to be carried across that chasm and into widespread use. Typically, we'll screen a couple hundred measures and look in more detail at the ones that look most, most attractive. And in our last major scan in 2004, we found there was still a huge reservoir, but we were getting a little bit smaller in the average savings per measure. And the other thing that we have found now is that the human wear is really important, that it's about how you design a building, not just what widgets you put in it. That the idiots who put in under, oversized pumps and undersized pipes are costing you an enormous amount of money over the life of the, life of the building. But you put in an oversized pump because it doesn't cost much, and that's what they've got in stock. And you put in undersized pipes, because that's what the old guidelines, based on 30-year-old energy prices, tell you is optimal. And you're afraid that it'll cost you another nickel to go up a couple of pipe sizes on all that critical piping that's carrying chilled water around the building. So you always go with undersized pipes, besides they don't get in the way of stuff, and oversized pumps. And you get goosed on both ends. Here's one example, integrated design at a level much better than the energy code. In a base case, building 100,000 square feet might use 1,400 kilowatt hour, 1.4 million kilowatt hours per year. We can save a third of that. Not a bad saving. We also can save a lot of peak demand. Now, how many of you all are sensitive to the difference between energy use and demand? Okay. You've got to pay for the coal to turn the turbines, and that's the energy use. But it turns out that if you map or graph the cumulative hours, and this is not something I brought, the cumulative hours of the year from 0 to 8760, and look at the demand on the power grid, it has a couple hundred hours that are very high, and it drops very quickly down to about 50% and then tails off as you get into nighttime hours. If you can kill the highest demand of maybe 200 hours per year, 
maybe 400 hours out of 8760. You can cut the size of the generating plant you need enormously. Generation costs you a couple of thousand dollars a kilowatt to build, install, and augment the distribution network and the transformers. Hey, such a deal I've got for you, Mr. Air Conditioner Manufacturer. If you can help me avoid a kilowatt's worth of demand, if I'm the utility, that's worth serious money. So now we see people cycling their air conditioning compressors to make you, the chillers, to make you uncomfortable so they can save demand charges, which are half the cost of electricity for many large commercial users. Okay? So now we're able to win by both cutting the demand and the energy. So, cost of saved energy in that particular example was a dollar per kilowatt hour. And these are other parameters we use. But for, I'm sorry, a penny per kilowatt hour, which is a pretty good return on investment. Why aren't people picking that up? Because what it involves is, first of all, getting the architect and the engineer to talk to each other. Secondly, allowing the engineer, who's a sub to the architect, to talk to the owner. And thirdly, the engineer has typically been paid on a percentage of his piece of the contract. So if he was getting 3% or 5% of the mechanical system specified, bigger is better. He's got no incentive to help the architect get a more energy efficient design that wouldn't need as much mechanical equipment. He would spend more time to get paid less. There are $20 bills on the ground. So we've talked about that. I don't want to talk more about this. Uh, what I do want to say is that we've been going back and looking at some of this stuff. And a lot of the things that we thought could become important in 93, and I wasn't involved with that, actually have become mainstream now. And that's encouraging because of the market transformation stuff that I want to, to talk about. We've seen major investments by manufacturers, and I want to talk next a little bit about the market transformation work. Uh, just as an example, waiving sales taxes for more energy efficient equipment that's been so marked by the Energy Star program, and finally by standards, which we'll get to in a bit. Utilities have been major actors in many states only lately in Ohio, in getting more efficient stuff adopted in the market. If you buy a more efficient air conditioner, we'll give you 50 bucks. We have been bribing consumers for almost 20 years. And it works. Unfortunately, we had a major drop from something close to $2 billion a year down to just under a $1 billion a year culminating about 1998. This was when we went through our great experiment in free market electricity, in the deregulation of the electric utilities, instead of having them be monopolies that generated, transmitted, distributed, and sold it to the end user. We went through all this economic falderall, and it didn't work, and California had blackouts, and utilities are being asked again to invest on the customer side of the meter. Lots of utilities are doing this now. This is just the contrast between states in blue that are largely doing it with state funding and states in green which are largely doing it through the utilities. And states that ain't doing nothing. And when the slide was done, Texas was trying to make up its mind, but has since then launched very aggressive programs. These targets vary from state to state, but the more aggressive ones are showing some significant results. And the California savings in 2001, remember that was the years they were having their blackouts and calling on people, we will give you extra money, we will cut your utility bill if you cut your use by 20%. And that got people's attention. Besides, it's good for everybody if you do that. But typically we're seeing a lot of action around 2% savings as targets for utilities and a new regulatory structure that says if you achieve that 2% reduction or 1.5% or whatever it is in your case, we'll pay you extra money that more than makes up for the lost sales. So instead of the utility being 
incentivized through regulatory economics to sell more, it's being incentivized to sell less. So let's transition to standards and codes. Uh, if all of this is confusing, interrupt me. Let's not wait. Okay. Going back again, just a reminder of these learning curves that if we can get the demand up, the price will go down. And that's, that's our mantra. And it's generally true. There are some arcane questions about how you know what the starting point is, but it's not important. We've talked about this one, which underlies the Department of Energy standards process. And I want to give you a couple of examples that the, the fundamental thing the Department of Energy tries to do in balancing the needs of manufacturers, consumers, the environment, the nation, and everything else, is to look at life cycle costs. What's the cost of the investment in purchasing and installing the widget, the cost of operating and maintaining it over its lifetime, and the cost of the energy that it wants to gulp. And we do that on a discounted basis. And you typically get things that look like this. Now this is for vertical, open, remote condensing supermarket cold cases. Uh, this is stuff for non-frozen products. Happens to be one, this and the next, that I just pulled out of a, a standards process that I'm involved in now. This is efficiency levels, increasing efficiency this way, and this is the life cycle cost that DOE estimates. The important thing is to note that that's a pretty flat bottom. That's the difference between $26,700 imputed life cycle cost and $26,250. It's a $500 difference out of $26,50. It's a couple of percent. Do you know what the difference is between this and this? It's whether or not these things are using light emitting diodes to illuminate the yogurt or using fluorescence. That's the difference. Now, it gets better. The DOE has said, we don't really know what the cost in 2012 of light emitting diodes will be. And that's when this standard takes effect. Here's another example for vertical closed transparent door remote condensing stuff. Similar thing, slightly different results for a couple of reasons, but almost trivial difference in life cycle cost across a range of efficiencies. And this is why the law says that you have to adopt the maximum efficiency that's technologically feasible and economically justified. But there's all this fine print behind it. Now, this is furnaces, residential furnaces from some work I did a couple of years ago. And I love to use this example. Again, it's life cycle costs from $14,400 to, $14, to $15,000, a very compressed scale of total life cycle costs across a range of efficiency options. Now, I want you to notice here that once you get past the pure dog meat, today's minimum standard, 78% atmospheric vented, once you get past that and up to something that's halfway reasonable, this thing is $14,580 $14, or so life cycle cost. This minimum is $14,420. There is no difference when you figure that this is based on some stipulated assumptions about the escalation rate of electricity, the, the imputed actual interest rate the consumers will pay, the forward cost of metals, the future price of all the different technology widgets. And we're now trying to make decisions on a minimum life cycle cost that's all within the noise. When you get out somewhere in this range, you're talking about a different technology. You're talking about condensing furnaces that reclaim the latent heat of condensation from the natural gas you're burning. That's a 10% bump from 80% to 90%. <clears throat> On a national basis, it's a huge number for no life cycle cost difference that you would want to make any bets on at all. So we have some fundamental problems with the way we develop standards, and yet we don't know much smarter ways. 
Here is some stuff we can do retrospectively, though. This is actually the average price paid to manufacturers for residential central air conditioners by year. From 1990, 92 is when the standard took effect, short bump in 1993, and then inflation adjusted prices decreased. They actually dropped. This is a testimony to all of the manufacturers that when a standard comes into play, the response is to redesign not only the product, but the manufacturing process to drive out the costs and inefficiencies in manufacturing. And that and some consolidation in the distribution channel, which doesn't show up here, that's an additional price decline. This is manufacturer prices leads the new generation of products at higher efficiency to almost inevitably be less expensive than the products they replace. There's a free lunch. Manufacturers have, yeah, the industry is consolidated, but they're still making a living. And this just adds several other products, uh, refrigerators and gas furnaces. Same sort of thing, we're going to take credit for all the standards activity, you can look at it later on the video if you want to. But the point would be that there's, at very least, a very strong correlation between adopting standards and a decline in consumer prices across a broad range of consumer products. Standards cost money, right? Now, this stuff can add up. And we've done a series of studies. And again, I've been on the periphery of these. I tend to be focused on the equipment and the systems but when you start looking at it in terms of all the possibilities across transportation, buildings, utilities, and other sectors, this happens to be results from Maryland. We're doing work in Ohio now. We've done work in Florida, Texas, uh, have just finished Virginia, and have a bunch of states lined up, three or four or five per year for the next several years with the funding in place to look at these. And the point would be that your expectation would be a general increase in the amount of electricity sales, sold. And here's a suite of things that we've analyzed that we will assert can actually lead to a drop. Not to a slowing in the rate of increase, but to a drop in the amount of electricity required. For those who can't read it, this is combined heat and power, distributed generation where you're using the waste heat for air conditioning or manufacturing processes, tighter building codes, some R&D initiatives that we don't know what they'll get us, but we think they'll get us stuff, appliance standards, and state and utility programs to help encourage the adoption of better stuff. We believe we can actually get real reductions, not just rates, declining rates of increase. Now, I want to return to my advocacy role here which is really about the death of economics. That, that economics as an art has learned to model the ever more, cane with the ever more arcane with the ever more unrealistic assumptions. It does great models, but some people have noted that the more recent prizes in economics from Nobel have been about applied psychology and behavioral sciences. They haven't been about modeling, okay? Modeling doesn't seem to relate to what's happening in the world. And if you get more sophisticated than just looking at the rate of return of investment, but think that, you know, I'm an old coot, I'm going to retire one of these years, I probably want to have pretty low risk so I don't run out of money. But my son probably would like to have a portfolio which has safe investments like treasuries used to be, and some things which have a little bit more risk, but the potential to grow faster. So a balanced portfolio would have a mixture of things which are a little bit more volatile year to year with things that have different rates of re expected return. We believe that if you look at things hard, this 25% or so rate of return on investment from energy efficiency that's three to three and a half year payback. It's a pretty good deal. And that's the stuff that's four cents a kilowatt hour or less. And if you think about it in terms of its risk, 
The risk you have in an energy efficiency investment is that you assumed that your energy prices would be higher than they turned out to be. You've also made the taken a risk that the newer technology might not work as well as, well, you know, there's an old story about plumbers. They're real risk takers. Every plumber is willing to install the stuff that his grandfather did. They don't retest that stuff at all. They're happy to install it. Okay. So there's always some sense of risk about the newer technologies like the condensing furnace. But if you look at the traditional figure of higher returns associated with higher risk, we think energy efficiency stands in a somewhat different position. And I think we can extend that to many things in, in renewable energy as well. Renewable is good stuff, and we need it. And it's part of our investment portfolio for a lot of the same reasons, or it should be. But it's still perched at somewhat higher costs than we see for energy efficiency. This weird-looking graph is just to make the point that's based on work by my colleague Le Neil Elliott that another thing about efficiency is to think about elasticities and inelasticities at points of constriction in the market. When you're into a real natural gas supply disruption, when the, the rail line out of the Wyoming basin has been disrupted by, by snow and it's going to be weeks before they get it and you're running out of coal, when you're in that kind of a disruption, when a hurricane messes up your availability of gasoline, if you can do a very small decrease in demand, say 2%, you are so nearly inelastic near that binding point that you're likely to see a 20% drop in price, in the short run price. So we think that efficiency actually can have, and behavioral response, can be an important part of the portfolio for dealing with short term disruptions and longer term instabilities in the market. And most of us happen to believe that peak oil is real. So, lessons. There have been some structural changes in the economy. But energy efficiency has been the biggest resource for 30 years. We believe in doing analysis. We don't believe that economics always works right. We don't think that politics always works right. We do believe that both major candidates will be somewhat more pragmatic than the theologians who have set policy in this administration. And we're optimistic as a result of that. And at that point, I think that's the last slide I wanted to bother you with. Yeah, that's the last one. So, your turn. Well, first of all, thank you, Harvey. <laughs> I'm sorry that this was not a very good EECS seminar. I didn't differentiate anything. You didn't integrate anything in it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do that stuff anymore. Yes? Yeah, um, the cost of electricity. Um, electricity is one of those very rare products where the retail price is five times the wholesale price. Um, when you make comparisons with the cost of electricity, um, you, you are choosing to make them with the retail price because you are looking at it from the consumer point of view. I wonder if you'd like to comment on this issue of what price for electricity you should really be using when you're discussing these comparisons. Actually, I really handicapped myself. It's an important point. On those diagrams, by and large, the supply side costs were...